Hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. We're usually talking salmon and trout on the show, but today we're going to be focusing on another fish that's very important to the Great Lakes, but in a different way. Joining us today is Jay Wesley. He is the Lake Michigan Basin Coordinator for the Michigan DNR. Jay, thanks for joining the show. You bet, Chris. Before we get started, Jay, what does a Lake Michigan Basin Coordinator do? Well, I, I co-manage Lake Michigan, so I work with the other state biologists and tribal nations and Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies to manage the entire fishery in Lake Michigan. So from bait fish to stocking to trying to improve wild production regulations, all that jazz. Well, that sounds like a really big job. <laughs> we'll probably get into some more of that as we go, but uh, we're going to talk alewives today. Uh, let's start kind of at the beginning, at least for the Great Lakes. Uh, people who are not connected to fishing might believe that alewives are just simply women who serve beer, but it is a fish <laughs> with an interesting history in the Great Lakes. Can you tell us a little bit about the species itself and, and kind of its its uh, history in the Great Lakes? Yeah, um, so they're actually from the Atlantic Ocean, so they're not even from the Great Lakes. They work their way into the Great Lakes, we're thinking around 1920, maybe 1930, as uh, humans developed, you know, pathways around the Niagara Falls. So um, once that happened, mainly through the Welland Canal um, and through the Erie Canal, alewife found their way, you know, up into Lake Erie and then up into the other upper Great Lakes. They weren't really an issue until, you know, other invasives came in too, through the same mechanisms. So we got sea lamprey that came in. I'm sure your listeners are well, really familiar with sea lamprey. Well, they devastated the, the predator population that we had in the lakes, mainly lake trout. So with the lack of lake trout, lack of burbot and other predators, these alewives eventually started to reproduce uh, really well in the Great Lakes and really became overpopulated. Probably about 1950 to 1970, they, they hit a peak and they're dying off, crazy, creating uh, just... A, a mess along beaches and around towns um and so it really uh after that um you know salmon were brought in to, as one part of the puzzle to try to to reduce their numbers so you talked a little bit about uh reproducing reproduction what is the life cycle of an alewife like and how does it start how does it end tell us a little bit about that yeah and so in the ocean they spend most of their adult life in ocean salt water and then they come into fresh water or brackish water to spawn um so similar i guess once they got into the great lakes um obviously they're always in fresh water but they would um you know adults are out in the in the big lake feeding on zooplankton um, in the spring, they come in near shore, um, often in under our rivers and drown river mouth lakes, harbors, uh, spawn there. Um, the larvae then uh, are pretty much suspended. They out migrate into the, the big lake, are suspended over deeper waters um, until they're about a one year old and then they, they, they go deeper. And then by the time they're about one, two, they're, they're reproducing again. They live to about we used to have them up to about nine years. Now, most the alewife, at least in Lake Michigan, are six years or younger. And why is that? You said they're they're mostly six years or younger. Younger. Um, why? What's behind the age structure? Yeah. So we call it a truncated age structure. Part of it is due to there's been some poor natural re reproduction of alewife through the years. So ever since salmon were stocked, their population has been going down. Um, so you get a couple of poor year classes and you just don't have enough to live to be an older age. And our, our predator stocks got a little too high. So we think through predation that they were cropping off, you know, a lot of the alewife and bigger magnum size alewife, those older age classes. We were actually down to four year classes in Lake Michigan and we've got it back up to six. So we're on a better trajectory than what we were. You said magnum size. How big does an alewife get? I mean, what would be kind of a, I guess, a trophy alewife? Yeah, <laughs> probably up to 11 inches or so. But I think a nine, nines are pretty darn big these days. Um, the majority of them are in that two to three inch range. Okay. Uh, I did I did do a little research, and it was interesting to me, 
you know, you talked about them being an ocean dwelling fish that a lot of those states really have a moratorium on, on uh, harvest of them or even just possessing them. Um, but in the Great Lakes, uh, you know, obviously it's a balance, but we've kind of, you know, we put salmon in to get rid of them. Uh, the prey predator relationship affects species on land and in water. How delicate of a balance exists between alewives and salmon in Lake Michigan today? Yeah, it's it's very delicate today. Um, and we're actually looking at it annually to see how many alewife we got out there. Our, our fear was that we we're going to collapse the alewife population. And by doing so, you would at least collapse, also collapse the Chinook salmon population because they are so linked together. I mean, probably 90 Five to 99 percent of a Chinook's diet is alewife so we got to have some alewife out there but uh, you don't want too many either or else you start to get die-offs and things and and historically when there are die-offs going back to the 50s 60s 70s many of the states uh, commercially harvest the alewife just to try to help get rid of them but today we welcome at least as fisheries biologists and anglers I think in the Great Lakes we welcome alewife they're, uh, they're an important part of the, the fishery and the balance. And, you know, that's what our job is, try to figure out how many alewife are out there and how many predators, salmon and trout, we can manage for to, to maintain that balance. Alewives are a food source for salmon, but I've also read that they, they can help protect young salmon and trout from predation. Is that something that you guys see as well? Absolutely. It, it's it's kind of anecdotal. Um, there hasn't been a lot of studies about it, but we often see better year classes of, um, of Chinook salmon, steelhead, coho, even brown trout following a good year class of alewife. So I guess the theory is if there's lots of fish out there, small fish, um, that a predator is less likely to eat a freshly stocked salmon or trout or a, a wild salmon coming out of the rivers but when those alewife aren't around then those predators are really looking for anything to eat and so our stocked fish and even wild fish coming out of the rivers are fair game and even seagulls and cormorants everything will key in on them so having those alewife around we're actually seeing better survival of our stocked fish and really noticing it on the on the boards that people are putting fish up on that we're seeing a lot of one-year-old fish in the catches today, which we didn't the last, you know, probably five, six years. So it, it's good news for us. Yeah, Jay, you know, I'd love to have you on the show to discuss a lot of different topics. Um, but today's discussion was really prompted by this die-off on the Michigan shores of Lake Michigan of alewives. Uh, it's, it's been in the newspapers kind of everywhere. Uh, these die-offs used to be pretty common, but haven't seen one like this in quite a while. Can you kind of give us some insight on what's happening uh, with all of that? Yeah, so like I mentioned, historically it happened all over the place all the time and was quite massive and lake-wide. Um, but it's we haven't really seen a die-off since maybe 2010, 2012. So this year is quite unusual. A few things going on. So some of the theories are, and I'll be absolutely honest, we don't know why these die-offs occur, but some of the theories are that they're sensitive to temperature changes. So early spring, we often have, you know, changing wind direction, which can create upwellings and you'll get cold water and then warm water come in. So that, that causes some stress to the fish. They're in shallow, um, usually that time of year spawning. So just the act of spawning causes stress. And we also think that they do become malnourished over winter. They can't find enough plankton and zooplankton to eat that they're just kind of weakened in a weakened state in the springtime. So that's always been the, the theory of the die-offs. Um, and so a lot of it is that the alewife population has come up. We've reduced salmon stocking for a number of years and we've actually seen an uptick in the biomass of, of alewife where the biomass is about, we, we measure it by weight, so it's about 100 kilotons right now, which is what we had in about 2010, 2012. So it just may be a, a numbers thing. Um, but we'll keep an eye on it to make sure that nothing else is going on. But it is quite unusual. It's, it, it's anywhere from Grand Haven up to um, the Upper Peninsula on Lake Michigan and even uh, starting to show up in Green Bay and even on the, on the Wisconsin side. So we'll keep an eye on it. 
um, see if it's because of the, the typical reasons or see if something else is going on. You, you kind of put a number there on what you think as far as numbers of alewives. I used to work in the, in the hunting media and, you know, there's always been this debate of like how many deer are actually in the state. And of course the folks that, um, you know, are hunting say it's a lot less than the folks that are doing the managing. That seems to be like a debate all the time. And I think that's something that you see here. If you go out and you talk to charter captains and you go talk to the anglers, they always seem to have a little bit different opinion than what a lot of the people that actually manage a game uh, believe as far as a population. So how do you come up? You, you had a, a pretty specific number there. How do you measure the alewife population? Yeah, so we use a lot of different approaches. Um, each each approach has its own limitations. So there's something called a bottom trawl, which uh, has been used since the 70s. So that's a long-term data set. It's done at the same transects throughout the lake every year. So it kind of can help us understand how things are changing over time. But if conditions of the lake change, then that type of gear may not be as effective. So the lake is a lot clearer than it used to be. So there may be some avoidance of that trawl now, but we still collect that information because it's important. We, in the 90s, mid 90s or so, started the acoustics. So it, it's just like the, you know, the fish graphs that people have that are, you know, are seeing alewives on the graph or looking for salmon. This is a little bit more high tech. And then the targets, um, we actually identify what the targets are by putting a midwa midwater trawl down to the areas we're seeing the targets and then figuring out what kind of fish they are. So we can tell the difference of alewife or whether they're bloater chubs or something else in the, in the lake. Those are done at randomly. Uh, random transects both sides of the lake um and pretty long transects they're like 20 30 mile transects that's a pretty good indication of what's out there and matches more what the anglers are seeing the third thing we use is we know fish are eating these alewife um not only the salmon but the lake trout too so we can look at consumption so based on fish size and how they're growing we know that there had to be so many alewife to produce that uh, that growth rate. So th the three different methods are put into what's called a statistical catch at age model, and it gives us an estimate for the entire lake in, in a biomass or a weight. All right. Our show is pretty dedicated to fishing on the Great Lakes, and obviously anglers want more fish to catch. Uh, you put a lot of work into coming up with that data. How does the data that you collect on alewives affect the stocking efforts in the, in the state? Yeah, so we use um, a similar statistical catch at age. We use the alewife information, and then we want to know how many predators we got out there. So we're looking at lake trout, steelhead, brown trout, coho, chinook salmon, um, and get estimates of their population or weight. And then we use a ratio between, well, with all that information, we look at total consumption in the lake and how many alewife are being consumed. And then we also look at a direct relationship between the, the ratio of Chinook weight to alewife weight. And we know, we know in ecosystem models that um, they do really well if, there's, if it's uh, like 20 pounds of prey to one pound of predator. So uh, a Chinook needs at least 20 pounds um of alewife to produce a, a pound of weight itself so that's the great place to be and then we noticed a relationship between um the the number of alewife out in lake huron uh, when when that crashed and when chinook salmon started to to look really skinny and malnourished and and they actually crashed and that was about 10 to 1 so 10 pounds of alewife to one pound of, of chinook so that's a bad place to be. So we actually use that ratio. And if we're in a pretty good spot um, in terms of alewife biomass compared to predator biomass, that's a signal that, hey, we can we can introduce some more fish or stock some more trout or salmon. And if we're in a bad spot, getting down to that 10 pounds alewife to one pound of Chinook, um, we need to start reducing or reduce pretty quickly so we avoid a crash. So that's kind of how we we balance things. When you make a change, you got to kind of see how they, the lake reacts. So usually if we make a major 
stocking change. We like to wait three years just to allow things to adjust and um, and then we'll adjust again. But we're really looking at it annually and, you know, want, wanting to stop a crash if we're seeing one starting. And that's really interesting. You brought up Lake Huron and that was kind of going to be my next question is, you know, you're always trying to find that balance. That's the goal. What happens? What does it look like when it gets off balance? And how long do you think it would take to recover from a situation like that? Yeah, really good question. So Lake Huron crashed in 2004. Um, so now there's some evidence of re some resurgence of AOA from the northern part of the lake, but there's probably enough predation with the existing lake trout population and, and walleye population that it may never recover to, um, you know, it, it's pre-crash days, but at least it has a very good mixed fishery and, and the numbers of all the salmon and trout and walleye seem to be going up or getting to a point where it's, it's very fishable now and a, and a really good place to fish. So with Lake Michigan, we, we don't have really the big bays that would support a walleye type fishery. So we're really trying to maintain this trout and salmon fishery. You know, we do have, you know, a walleye fishery in Green Bay and little bays to knock, but that's not probably something that could extend throughout the entire lake. So we really don't want to get near a crash and and probably have been very conservative in our approach but it's it's the alternative just doesn't look good based based on the fishery we have now and i'm not sure from what i hear from our anglers that they want to shift all their equipment and gear to a different style of fishery at this point and we don't even know what that would be so it's a pretty high risk um to crash the prey fish at this point yeah and you, you kind of you brought up Lake Huron. It sounds like you, you kind of know what's going on throughout throughout the Great Lakes. So I'll ask you this question: um, What you know, if, if the if the alewives are kind of just starting to come back in Huron, um, what kind of has moved in there as as the primary uh, bait fish for predator fish in the other parts of Lake Huron where the alewives have not come back to where they were? So there's also smelt in that area and then um you know native blade bloater chubs they're trying to restore some of the native herring or, or ciscos in that in that lake for uh, alternate prey but near shore you've got all kinds of native you know spot tail shiners and um, um uh, minnow species and things like that so you know the near shore the native fish are actually doing well because they're already adjusted to eating those types of fish but the offshore predators like your chinook salmon are, are were struggling because they just didn't have that pelagic prey out there that they're they're used to finding so they actually were swimming and still do swim over to lake michigan to feed and then go back to lake huron to, to spawn yeah, the lakes are are so connected it's been super publicized. Wisconsin has increased their stocking over the past few years. Obviously, both states, you know, are sharing the water. Uh, how does that decision in Wisconsin affect what you guys are doing and the decisions that you make on, on your side of the lake? Yeah, so we're usually in lockstep, and we have been for decades. Um, as we were reducing salmon stocking, all the states um, did it together. You know, we got to a point where Michigan did the the greatest reductions. Um, our rivers were producing a lot of wild Chinook salmon. So, you know, we chose back in 2012 to take the biggest cut. Um, when we proposed the cut in, it was based on 2015 data. So it was in 2016, there was a disconnect between us managers and, and the anglers uh, and the charter anglers and they were seeing bait out there that we were not seeing. We were not picking it up in our in our gear or trawls. So we were cons we were taking the conservative step, and we decided to reduce stocking even more. And that really upset um, anglers and angler groups and organizations, and they became political. So it was basically some political moves that you know forced states to to do some increasing or decreasing of other species. So we kind of lost that uh, working in lockstep um, over that occasion or that issue. But we are, you know, still working together at this point, talking about 
stocking increases together. You know, we work, we do this through what's called the Lake Michigan Committee, um, which all the states and tribes are, are part of. And anytime we can uh, manage a lake in consensus and, and work together, that's the way to go. So in hindsight, uh, Wisconsin increasing their stocking probably wasn't a big deal uh, based on the data we're seeing now. But based on the data that was provided to us in 2016, you know, we were more concerned about it. But uh, Michigan is actually um, proposing an increase where we'd go from about 650,000 up to a million fish next year. So we are we are proposing a, an increase as well. And I'm assuming that that was met with uh, a lot of smiles on the faces of, of the, those people that we just talked about, those, those fishing stakeholders. Absolutely. I mean, and they all think it's totally tied to stocking and, and we're really trying to get them to look at um, the wild production. We have probably 4 million wild smolts produced in, in Michigan rivers. So they just, I hope they acknowledge that. And when they look at their boards and see those young fish up there, you know, look for clips. If they're not clipped, you know, more than likely it's a wild fish. So that should give them an indication that a lot of the fish they're catching are wild fish and not because of stocking so our wild fish survival is going to be great too with these alewife around so that's where we have to be a little careful how many fish do we actually stock how quickly do we want to introduce more more fish to the system so we're, we're taking baby steps i think the lake can handle it at this point we'll just watch it all right we've been talking a lot about predator prey balance between alewives and trout and salmon what other things are out there that can affect alewife populations? Uh, what What's kind of something else that, that can cause issues there? Other invasive species. We have 187 invasives in the Great Lakes. Um, each time a new one comes in, it, it changes the whole lake balance. The, the biggest one was probably the zebra and quagga mussels. So we were tightly looking at the alewife uh salmon balance but then when quagga mussels came in and uh started to clear up the lakes that was the food for the alewives so now not only did we have great predation pressure on alewives the alewives are under pressure because they couldn't find enough to eat or sustain themselves so i think our capacity to hold alewife at least in lake michigan is at least it's probably a tenth of what it used to be it's maybe coming up a little bit but until quagga mussels are gone we're going to be at this lower capacity level and we're not going to be able to see the same salmon or alewife numbers out there that we historically had. What do you think the future holds for alewives in Lake Michigan? Where do you see it being maybe in the short term and long term future? In 2015, 16, I thought we we're close to a crash today. Um, I think we're in a, a great place. Um, we've got, six-year classes out there it looks like a strong 20 21 year class so we're in good shape you know the fact that we're talking stocking increases is, is is means we are in good shape so you know unless we have some major issues with uh, another invasive that comes in or uh, you know the, the lake clarity goes down we lose those zooplankton soon i think we're we're in a better place than we were you know uh, six years ago and we could expect that our salmon fishing should be as good as it was probably in the, you know, the 2010, 2012 time. So it, it's looking better for sure. Yeah, we're, we're in midsummer right now. What are you guys seeing over on that side of the lake as far as uh, kind of your creel reports and, and what people are bringing in for fish? Yeah, so the southern part of the lake um, was really good for coho early. We, we were seeing, you know, last four or five years, the Chinook fishery starting in the south, but it really didn't materialize. It started kind of in the middle part of the lake up north, and we had a really good king fishery in, in May and June in the first part of July, and it's kind of petered out a little bit now that's hit or miss. It's starting to pick up a little bit better on the Wisconsin side right now. Um, but we'll start to see some of those mature fish coming back across uh, to some of our big big river system starting August. So, so far, you know, not a lot of complaints. People are pretty happy. They get, they're getting a mix of some big fish, you know, nothing, nothing like last year when we had this, the state record, but uh, we're, we are seeing 
you know, fish just over 30 pounds coming in and lots of those one or two year olds, which is fun to see, you know, not as big as um, people would love to catch a bunch of 15, 20 pounders, but I like to see those smaller fish hanging just because it tells me that we've had some really good survival and those fish are going to work, work through the system next two, three years. Jay, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with us and answering these questions. Is there something about Ale Lives or Lake Michigan in general that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about today? Well, I, as a biologist, I must say that it's not all good about Ale Lives. Um, being an invasive species, they, do, they are detrimental to some other species. So that's why the balance is important. So Ale Life will eat the larvae of other fish, um, you know, including... Uh, our ciscos, our whitefish, our uh, yellow perch. Um, they also have um, something called diaminase that um, prevents other fish from absorbing uh, vitamin B in their eggs. And sometimes um, it, it causes some natural reproduction issues, especially with lake trout. Um, so they're not all good. And some people would probably like to see them eliminated, but we're just trying to maintain balance so we we maintain this great salmon fishery that was started here and um, hopefully it will continue for decades to come. Well, Jay Wesley, really appreciate your time coming on, your insight. And I think, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of captains. That's kind of our main, the main people that we have on the show. So it's fun to have people like yourself come on to kind of give us your perspective and what you guys are seeing. Uh, so we really appreciate it. I think our listeners will appreciate it as well. You bet, Chris. It was fun.